Hi guys, so today we have an awesome female handler joining us, Leah Balanis, AKA Copacetic Canine. So we have a lot of questions for Leah. Um, I am just going to go ahead and dive right in and invite in. Waiting for Leah. Hey, hello. How's it going? How's it going? Going well. How about yourself? It's good. How's LA? LA, it's crazy. You know, everything's really wild right now with COVID. So, you know, yeah, yeah. People are wild now. Mm -hmm. Well, it's awesome to have you on tonight. Oh, before thank you for having me. Yeah. So before we get started, I want to talk to you about your training business and how you got into dog training. Um, so, I mean, I've been into dogs my entire life, like ever since I was a kid. It's all I ever wanted growing up. And I grew up in an apartment, so I couldn't actually have dogs. So um, I didn't get my first dog until I was like eight years old. And uh, even then, he didn't even live with me. He lived at my grandma's house. So I would just go over there all the time and uh, take him out, walk him, train him, all that stuff. Um, but for Fresh Wing, I got started a few years ago when I was working at Blue Collar Working Dog. It's a working dog store here in Echo Park. So there I met a lot of trainers, uh, started the shadow one, shadowed them for, uh, for a while. And then from there, uh, so I started off in pet dogs. And then from there, I met someone who uh, worked with Gold Coast, worked with Gold Coast Canine. So I worked Hold on Gold a Coast. No, Hold on, sorry. Guys. Guys, can you please have Tito sit? Can you grab Tito, please? Sorry, Tito is a little rescue chihuahua who uh, oh, likes to bark. <laughs> so I, sorry, I couldn't concentrate. Okay, so um, continue what you're saying. You linked up with Gold, Gold Coast yeah. Canine? Yeah, so from Blue Collar, I went and worked at Gold Coast for about a year. There I trained police, military, and the home protection dogs. Um, and there I did the obedience and the detection. And then mm -hmm. after Gold Coast, um, I just decided that it was best that I went off and did my own thing. It was never planned. It was never the plan. I never thought to myself that I would own and run my own business, but here I am and it's actually going really, really well. That's awesome. Congratulations. Great work. Thank you. So um, with your training, what do you um, focus on mainly with your clients? Um, so I'm a balance trainer, right? So I always train the dog in front of me, whatever uh, tools, methods necessary to get that dog and the owners where they need to be. Um, so I guess it's really hard for me to pinpoint like my style. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, like I said, it's nothing's a uh, cookie cutter when it comes to dog training. So, you know, I mean, there are times where I never even put a prong on a dog if they don't need it. Um, I don't use e-collars on dogs uh, very often. I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of trainers use e-collars on a lot of their client dogs, which isn't bad. But um, I firmly believe that uh, in order for the dog to be introduced to an e-collar, the handler has to be able to, or owner has to be able to handle the dog on leash first before we can go to any off leash. Mm -hmm. And do you normally work with, um, with clients one-on-one -on -one or is it a board and train program? Um, so for me, private lessons are more popular. I think boarding trains are, um, a lot of people have more time on their hands right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so boarding trains are a little bit slow. So right now, private lessons are really popular and I find a lot of su success in them. And what I'm also finding is a lot of my clients, once we they finish like a package or whatever, they want to buy more because they just want to keep learning, which that always mm -hmm. excites me, right? Like the owners wanting to do more and wanting to get their dog even further than, you know, what their first goals were. So as a trainer, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had uh, a lot of questions about the e-collar, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, yep. s someone was asking, uh, what are your thoughts on training with an e-collar and using it for correction? So, I mean, the e-collar is a very universal tool in my opinion, right? Um, I think you know, sometimes trainers are afraid to say that the e-collars are used for corrections, um, you know, just afraid to scare the client away or anything like that. But you have to remember um, the e-collar is an aversive tool, right? Like it is meant to cause the dog some kind of discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, 
you know, for if you're working recall, right, and the dog's not recalling, guess what? That e-collar is going to get turned up until you get back, right? Mm -hmm. It's just very, very important that the dog understands what the e-collar means and how to make uh, mm -hmm. how to make it go away. I feel like that's the biggest um, issue is people think it's a very simple thing. You just throw the e-collar on the dog and boom, it starts to work, right? But if mm -hmm. it's not properly introduced, if the dog doesn't understand how to make the stim go away, then it's going to cause confusion. It's going to cause fear, right? And there's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, conflict with the, with the dog and the, and the owner, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as it's introduced properly, it, the, it sh the dog should understand, uh, you know, why it's being used at the time, like if it's being mm -hmm. used, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think that's good that you have all those one-on-one one -on -one, uh, training courses because it's really about training the, the owner. The owners, as yeah. And just the dog. Um, bef uh, before we go to all the other questions, can you talk to me about your own personal dogs? Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll start off with Waylon, who's actually, let's see if I can, he's right there, he's laying down, it's a little, Donut, no. <laughs> um, so Waylon is my uh, my first like own personal dog that I got when I uh, when I moved out, uh, and he was the one that introduced me into this entire like dog world. So I ended up making him his own Instagram, where a lot of people know me is from his page, Waylon underscore Um That page ended up blowing up in a way I never thought. It got over like twenty k and. Um, you know, I met a lot of great people through there. It's how I found out about Blue Collar and was able to get hired there. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, everything I have today, I honestly owe to Waylon. Waylon is, like, he's gotten me here. I've learned so much from him. I trained him myself. Um, and I'm very proud of, even with all the limited knowledge I, I had when I, uh, when I got him, because I didn't know anything when I got Waylon. Um, you know, he's what I consider backyard bred mountain law. And, um, you know, but... It's been an interesting journey with him for sure. So he's the dog that's so when you got Waylon, when you got Waylon, um, what was that journey like in the beginning? Like, Waylon was an absolute nightmare as a puppy. He was yeah. like the worst of the worst. Um, crate training him was a nightmare. Um, I was definitely in over my head. Um, you know, he, uh, incredibly smart dog. So he was an escape artist. So he learned how to get out of wire crates um, and not just like bust them open. Like he knew how to like lift up the latch and slide <laughs> it and like actually open the door. Um, then when I tried switching them to plastic crates, he learned that if he hit the door hard enough, it'll just pop open. So, uh, so yeah, up until about six months, he was either not in the crate or he would pee and poop in there just to get out. It was like madness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so, um, and then yeah, did, were you working with a trainer or uh, when did you start at Blue Collar? So I did, um, I did, I actually reached out to Oscar with Elevated Canine. He was the first person I uh, reached out to when Waylon was maybe like three or four months and mm -hmm. um, had a great first session. At, but at the time I was still in school and the nights that he was doing like uh, bite work and stuff didn't match up with my schedule. So I wasn't able to go and see him. Uh, as frequently as I wanted to and then I had him evaluated by another trainer but that didn't work out um, and then I met up with another trainer um, I won't say any names but uh he was not a great trainer but at the time I didn't know what was good training what was bad training and they ended up putting on a lot of pressure on Waylon when he did not need it, it made me feel like I had to be hard on him uh, in order to get the results that I was looking for and it really did a number on our relationship. And I spent, I've spent the last few years like really repairing that with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, it took me a while to find good trainers. And I'm very thankful that I kind of went through that experience as hard as it was. Um, but it helped me, it helped set me up for a more successful go uh, this uh, next time around with Lycan. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so yeah. And it probably uh, makes you a better trainer because you've been in that person's shoes of not really knowing what to do and having yeah. a really smart Malinois. Uh, and like you, you know the struggle. So yeah, that's definitely. Yeah, I mean, Waylon is like, I, 
not just because he's my dog, but honestly, I just, I've never met a dog that thinks the way Waylon does. Like, he's incredibly smart. And, um, you know, one thing I always tell all of my clients is don't humanize your dogs. But even I find myself, like, struggling that uh, with that sometimes with Waylon because of the stuff that he does. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, with people he doesn't like, this is one of my favorite kind of stories with him. Uh, we used to have this uh, one roommate that used to live with us that Waylon did not like for whatever reason just did not like him so Waylon would go out of his way to mess with him so at our <laughs> old house we used to have a swimming pool and uh anytime this, uh anytime that guy went swimming Waylon was like at our door at our window just like watching him like waiting for him to get out because as soon as he would get out Waylon would go and run and grab his towel and like run <laughs> away with it like <laughs> Like, it was something, like, mess. I never taught him to do that. I never taught him to, like, grab towels. Like, that was just something he would do. Or if, like, I would let him out and he was in the middle of, like, drying himself, Waylon would go and, like, snatch the towel from him. Oh, and, like, right. yeah, like, just, mm -hmm. I don't know any kind of dog that does that stuff. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning. <laughs> so, with Waylon, um, is Wh what sort of things do you do with Waylon? Is he a sport dog or... Um... So originally, dog, I did get him how, for how do we even classify that? Waylon is a glorified pet. He's um, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't do bite work. Um, he doesn't. Uh, I tried to do bite work with him, but it's just he doesn't have the nerves for it. You know, it's not fun for him. It's more stressful. Um, I mean, he'll go and he'll bite all day, but I'd rather not put him through it if it's not something he's gonna truly enjoy. Um, so. Um, I wanted to do, like, other stuff with him. I mean, he's getting, like, I mean, he's not that old. He's going to be six in April. But, I mean, like I said, with a, you know, poorly bred dog, you're going to run into issues. And I think he's going to have, like, hip issues or, you know, joint issues and stuff. Because even after, like, a session at the park, just throwing the ball, he's very slow the next day, you know, to, like, wake up in the morning. He's, mm -hmm. you know, so I'd rather not put him through too much, mm -hmm. uh, too much, uh, like, strenuous activity that's gonna you know do a number on his joints if I don't need him to and he's very content being a pet dog like active pet um mm -hmm. I mean as you can see he'll, he'll chill on the couch all day with me if he needed to that's nice but was he always like that chilling on the couch um, I mean yes and no so with me if I'm around yes he'll chill out and hang out with me all day or my fiance um, but if he's left with anyone else, then he'll like go and be a madman. Wreak havoc. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. it's like, I would say it maybe about three years old is when he started like settling down like normally, just, you know, even with other people. Mm -hmm. Three and a half, you said? About, uh, about three years old. Yeah. Okay. It's a long, long way to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So um, one of the questions was, how do you calm uh, an, an anxious Malinois? Uh, so for any kind of like anxious behavior in the house or calm, either the crate or place. So uh, utilizing the place command, you know, where the dog has to go and lay down. And for some dogs, it could take, you know, a couple minutes. For some dogs, they could be like up and awake for an hour just laying on place but that's where you just kind of play the waiting game right you give the dog the clear rule of like hey you stay on this bed don't get up and eventually the dog's just gonna settle right mm -hmm. it might take a few tries you might have to get you know the dog's gonna try and get up put them back but at that point you're just waiting them out you want you want to wait for that calm because eventually it'll come mm -hmm. so um what do you do if the if the puppy's crying or uh you know you can either i just ignore them. It's something that they have to work through, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, um, you know, you can't go like if you're if the dog is anxious, you know, and you're just like yelling at it to shut up or be quiet, you're not going to get anywhere, right? You're only stressing the dog out more. So this is one of those things where you kind of have to let the dog figure it out. Like an anxious dog that's sitting down on the bed, there's nothing for them to be afraid of. You know, there's mm -hmm. there's nothing you inside your house, they're hanging out. So it's really just giving the chance to learn how to go on and settle, you know, by themselves, right? Instead mm -hmm. of relying on the owner to do it for them or coddling them, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if the dog's like really, really anxious, you can try, you know, giving them some kind of chew, like a bully stick or something like that. 
um, you know, whatever works for that dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next question, how, uh, how do you stop a Malinois from whining due to excitement around other dogs and being impatient? Um, so for that, I mean, you'd have to figure out exactly why the dog is whining. Is it, is the dog whining? Like, is it excitement? Is it insecurity? Is it like fear of missing out kind of thing? Um, it's kind of a broad question just cause again, like every dog is different. Some dogs are genetically more predisposed to whining, right? Like some dogs just can't help it and they just need to, you know, let out that frustration somehow. And that could be in the whining or, uh, however that is. Um, in that instance, I think an e if the dog is conditioned to the e-collar properly, then you can use an e-collar to correct them, to stop them from whining. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's really just about figuring out exactly why the dog is whining. So really pinpointing that reason. You know, so for example, if uh, let's say it is just straight excitement, the dog just wants to like, you know, just wants to be a part of whatever's going on, then I would just use the e-collar and correct them, tell them to be quiet. I mm -hmm. mean, it's not too complicating, I don't feel. Mm -hmm. And um, what are the different dog breeds that you primarily train? Um, so I train any any breed, any age, any size. Um, but because of uh, because of the dogs I have, I do get a lot of Malinois, like shepherds. Um, uh, I don't get very many small dogs. I think that's probably mm -hmm. like the rarest one, any small breeds. Um, but that's mainly it. Yeah, I mean, I'll train any dog, but like I said, because of the dogs that I have, I think I attract more of the Mal, uh, Malinois, Dutch Shepherd, German Shepherd community. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had some people asking, we, we had a couple of German Shepherd owners ask about how many times they should train their uh, German Shepherd a day, starting from when they're puppies, like eight weeks when they come home. So... Again, this is one of those, like, it's like a really broad question, right? Because um, everybody's schedule is different. But for me, um, training sessions are quick, right? Especially starting off with puppies. Like, your training session should be, like, three to five minutes max, if even that. Um, so for me, it's just, like, find times throughout the day. The more you do it, the better your dog's going to be, right? So I would aim for a puppy at least two to three times a day. Or I would say three, since a puppy needs to eat three times a day. Shoot for three. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can do more, do more, right? So I like finding, uh, so anytime I tell my clients, it's just like, look, I don't know what your schedule is like. I don't know what you're doing like during the day, but those little like moments, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you're waiting for your like coffee to finish brewing, like that's a good time, right? Like, all right, let's like pump out this quick little lesson, right? Like mm -hmm. right after lunch, maybe I have some downtime, boom, let's do another, um, another like session right here. So mm -hmm. it should be, you know, as often as you can, the more the better. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, another question, every time I train my four month old German shepherd, uh, she gets bored five minutes into training. Then, uh, then you're going too long. So if you're finding that, uh, that your dog is like throughout your session starts their, uh, their energy lever starts to go down, then your less, your sessions are lasting too long. So it's about quality over quantity, right? So if I'm training my puppy, and let's say like the first two reps were like solid reps. The dog did exactly what I wanted there with energy. I'll end it there, right? Mm -hmm. Like no need to push for more. Like if I got a really, really good session, like boom, end it there. Because if you start, like if you get two really good ones and I'm guilty of this too, right? Where the dog's doing so well and you just want to keep doing more, right? But then you start doing too much and the dog starts getting tired. Now your reps aren't as good. Now the dog's bored, right? They're, they've been doing the same thing for five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're working on sit, can you imagine, like, just practicing sit for five minutes straight? That's boring. That's super, mm -hmm. super boring. So um, don't be afraid of doing sh uh, short sessions. If the first two are solid, boom, end it there. You mm -hmm. know, don't ask for too much. And then once the dog starts getting older, like, once you start, like, transitioning from all the treats, um, how do you know when to stop, like, you know, like with Rika, for instance, like she could go all day long. Like mm -hmm. she just loves, like if we have the ball at the tug, like she just wants to go. When, um, when should you stop a training session with an older, more eager dog? Um, it's honestly the same answer, right? Like you want to make sure that you end on your real, on a really, really good rep. So 
um, you know, with lichen, um, let's say if we're working on healing, for example, right, he'll do, he'll, he'll practice healing with me all day because he loves it, right? Mm -hmm. But his energy level will go down. So the more I do it, the, the, uh, um, you know, the quality of the rep is going to go down, right? So if I, if, so if he, I see a really, really good one, even if he wants to keep going, I'm still going to end it there because I know the next one might not be as good. Right. Mm -hmm. And I want him to remember the best, like the best part of our training session. I always want him to think, I always want to finish a session with him, like him thinking to himself, like, wow, that was great. Mom was mm -hmm. happy. I was happy. I got to play with my toy. Um, you know, so it's just dependent, like read your dog, you know, is your dog's energy still really there is, you know what I mean? And then like breeds like mom was can go all day. Right. So just because they can go all day, doesn't mean that they should. You know, mm -hmm. they, they need to rest. They need to um, take time to, like, relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we have a question. Uh, how young would you say to start training specifically with a Malinois? Because everyone says early, but how early? Need specific time frame age group-wise? Um, I mean, as soon as your puppy comes home, right? So I know um, a lot of other trainers have said it, um, you know, Tra like every interaction you have with your puppy is training, right? Mm -hmm. Like any, whether you even you just taking them out of the crate and letting them go to the bathroom, like anything that happens there is going to influence your, um, you know, your training, your relationship and stuff like that. You know, uh, when it comes to like working dogs and stuff, everybody has their own, um, everybody has their own uh, ideas or ways that we should raise puppy. You know, like I have a, a good friend of mine great trainer she's a really good uh, great dog handler like for instance like her she she believes in letting puppies be puppies right so she doesn't do any training with them until they're like older you know what i mean and that's what works for her and uh the reasoning for that is because uh she wants the puppy just to be a puppy she doesn't want the dog to have to worry about anything you know grows up more confident you know, and stuff like that versus me like I want my dog to have like these good behaviors and stuff early on right so i'm going to work on manners you know door manners uh, furniture manners, all that kind of stuff. Right. So it's all dependent on your lifestyle and what your goal is with that dog. Right. So if you have a sport dog, you want to do something with them, right. Mm -hmm. Whether, um, uh, you know, whether that's like teaching luring, you know, engagement, tug, all that kind of stuff. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean that the dog has to be sitting and downing, you know, as soon as they come home. Right. But mm -hmm. there's definitely stuff you can work on when that puppy comes home. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dirty Max Diesel. My husband and I both work eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. So how would you say training-wise to fit that in? Sorry, one second. I don't know why. It's just going, go away. Okay. Sorry, what was the question? My husband and I both work. Um, so for a puppy or? Uh, Dirty uh, Max Diesel. I mean, what? eight hours um, a day, Monday through Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, I mean, like, if that's a, like, if you work eight hours a day and you have a puppy, that's probably not, um, I mean, if you're not doing too much with it, um, you know, before you leave for work, do a session. As soon as you come home, do a session. Like, that's something that you have to, uh, you know, you have to fit in. Working eight hours a day, five days a week is an excuse not to train the puppy. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so finding time in the morning, whether that's getting up an hour early to make sure that you get you get something done with your puppy. If you have the ability to go home on your lunch and do something with the puppy, then, you know, I would do that. But you definitely have to fit it into your schedule somehow. Yeah, it, it looks like, yes, it's a puppy. I yeah. wonder how um, potty training would work. Yeah, so see, like, with the puppy, um, like, any clients that I have that work, like, you know, uh, like a nine to five or whatever it is, I tell them to hire someone, you know, if they can have someone come in, let their puppy out, you know, um, you know, whatever that may be, if they're working with a trainer, if the trainer is able to help with the puppy, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so you said that um, during COVID, you've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions and people are really into it, you know. They finish a package, want to train, um, want to continue training. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge for um, dog owners who have, who got a puppy during COVID? Um, biggest challenge. I mean, it's, 
I mean, people with a, if they come to me with a puppy, there's not really a challenge, right? Because I'm starting them off on the right foot. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when I get like those like six, seven, eight month old puppies, the ones that are starting to kind of grow into themselves, um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is lack of boundaries. You know, oftentimes a lot of owners just kind of let their dogs do whatever they want and they're okay with it, right? Mm -hmm it's easy to deal with a puppy that's, you know, a three month old puppy that wants to jump and bite on you, right? But when that puppy's seven, eight months old, and now they're jumping on like, you know, jumping on the furniture, you know, mouthing you and stuff like that. I feel like that's where people, um, you know, really struggle. And that's where people start to come to me. But um, it always just boils down to lack of boundaries, the dog's just able to do whatever they want, you know, um, the dog's able to manipulate their owners into doing whatever they want. You know, like my biggest thing is, uh, um, like a lot of owners will be like, yeah, you know, right at seven, right around the like 6 p.m. hits, my dog's barking and whining at me because they know it's time for dinner, right? Like that kind of stuff. Like letting the dogs mm -hmm. dictate that kind of um, uh, that kind of schedule, you know. Again, uh, you know, let, allowing dogs on furniture and stuff like that, creating problems like barking with people when they're when they're at the door, when people are walking by, uh, when they see other dogs, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is boundaries. And how do you train the owner to uh, like not let the dog on the furniture or uh, like let the dog dictate their life? It's um, they have to be more strict. The one, number one thing I always recommend is always a crate. I think it's important for the dog to be able to go into the crate, settle down. Um, you know, I think the hardest thing is when I tell owners they can't allow their dog on furniture anymore. I think that's the one I get the most like uh resistance on or people are like really i just have to stop letting them on the furniture it's like well yeah i mean you know that simple act like makes your dog think that they can do whatever they want right because yeah. the couch is no longer yours it's like all of yours now you mm -hmm. know what i mean so that's like um you know so just changing that mindset and the dog is really important i feel like it's really hard for uh, dog owners to do that. I've had clients like as soon as I said that they can allow their dogs on furniture or the bed that they're like, all right, we're gonna find another trainer. And I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. it's fine. You know, you I think it's hard for a lot of people. Yeah. Is there like a time a time cap? Like, okay, your dog can't be on the furniture for the first two months of having. So I don't, um, I don't do like an actual time frame because I don't like, I don't know. Sometimes some dogs pick it up really quick. Um, and I don't tell the owners that they could, their dog can never be on the furniture again, because then I'd be going against my own, my own word, because I mean, like Wayland's allowed on the furniture, you know, mm -hmm. um, but no problems stem from it. So once the dog understands what their role is, what their, what their rules are, you know, then you can start allowing the dog on furniture and see how their behavior changes. Do they go back to the bad behavior? Do they, you know, it's, it's up mm -hmm. to the dog and the owner, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, for a puppy, what is the best way to say no or correct bad behavior? Uh, literally just saying no and having a leash. Um, the leash, for whatever reason, is such a big issue for a lot of owners. Um, you know, puppies should always, always have a leash on them unless, you know, they're not like they're really ready to be off leash. But if the dog's jumping on the couch, right, if a puppy's jumping on the couch, physically getting the puppy and shoving them off isn't going to do anything, right? Puppy doesn't think that that's any kind of correction, but having the leash and physically being able to pull them off the couch saying no, is going to mean more than just like you picking them up and putting them back on the floor. Cause puppies can play that game all day. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. I just jump back up. I get carried, put on and back on. And it's just a cycle. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, having a leash is like the biggest thing, right? Is the dog trying to counter surf? Boom. Leash. Is the dog, is the puppy trying to rush out of the door? Boom, use the leash to stop them. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's it's actually really, really simple. And I, for whatever reason, owners just don't like keeping a leash on their puppy. It's- Well, I think because it's a really foreign concept. Like we always hear crate train your dog, you know, the furniture, don't let your dog on the furniture. Um, but the leash is just like, people don't even think, oh, that's an option. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, because we're so indoors, where's my puppy gonna go? But um, I mean, yeah, I mean, at least she's going to solve, help you or not solve, but help a lot of the issues that you're having with your puppy. Mm -hmm. uh, another person asked, um, my dog, my Malinois keeps biting me. How do I stop it? Um, so I have to like know more about the situation. That's not, it's a very, very broad question. 
Um, mm -hmm. Is it during play? Is it just randomly? Are you guys trying to hang out on the couch? Like, what's the what's the situation? Because if your dog is just biting you, that sounds like you should look for a trainer in your area um, right. to really help you evaluate what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so next question. What is the best way to teach my dog heal? Heal? Um, so healing, it's important that the dog understands where they're supposed to be at, right? So really working on like, so calling dogs into heal is a really uh, good exercise to practice and be consistent with it. Right. So, for example, like whenever um, so my dogs have a formal and an informal heel. Right. So they have like their focused heel and then their regular heel, which I just say with me. Right. So if I say with me, um, you know, both of my dogs will line their shoulder up with my leg. Right. And they know, OK, this is where I'm supposed to be at. Right. Um, so making sure that the dog understands exactly where they're supposed to be is going to be really important when it comes to uh, teaching a heel. Mm -hmm. Right. Be consistent with it. You know, a lot of times like some owners are OK with their dogs being a little ahead. You know, some owners want their dogs to be like right next to them the whole time. But whatever it is you're looking for, make sure that that's what you're paying. And uh, that's where you're being consistent with, because it's unfair if, you know, sometimes you get to like the dog gets to be a little bit forward and you don't mind. But then there's other days where you just want them to be right next to you. And then you're correcting them for something they've been doing, you know, mm -hmm. they've been doing prior. So when you're teaching the focused heel, that's with me, and then regular, like, heel is just heel? No, 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 no. Uh, focused heel is in French, so I say opier, and then okay. uh, just our, our informal heel, our informal healing is just with me. So the dog, okay. he doesn't have to be, like, looking up at me. He can look anywhere he wants. He just has to be lined up with my leg. Mm -hmm. Okay, Edgar is asking, how much crate time should I give my puppy? I would say, like, if I had to put a time to it, I would say about 75% of the day the puppy's in the crate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that varies with what your goals are with that puppy. Like for a pet, they can probably be out a little bit more. Um, if you're raising like some kind of sport dog, working dog, or whatever it is, uh, you know, they only come out when it's time to work or do something. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, puppies should be spending a majority of the day in the crate. I think it provides a lot of structure. It helps with the potty training. Um, you have to remember puppies are puppies. So the longer that they're out of the crate, the more room for error, the more room for accidents or getting into stuff, chewing on things, all that, all that puppy behavior, you know? So, so for if, a pet dog? Yeah. So for a pet dog, like, and even like, so for a pet dog, I would say if you cannot give all of your attention to the puppy, they should be away. Right. Like if you're the, like, if you're in the middle of cooking, it's probably not a good time to have the puppy out. Right, because you're mm -hmm. focused on cooking, right, and the puppy's off doing whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then for a, an adult dog, when can you transition, or do you recommend uh, that the pet owner transition out of crate time and just do place? Um, I mean, as a, I mean, as the dog gets older, you can. I mean, it's whatever works for that that owner and that that dog. You know, some dogs might be ready at like six months. Some dogs might be ready at a year. Um, I mean, the crate is always something I utilize. So even mm -hmm. like my adult dogs spend time in the crate just because I think it's important for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. I have definitely um, gotten way more lax with crate time. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. It just like the, the place has been the go-to or, or, I mean, I definitely let right go on the furniture. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah. Okay. I mean, so see, I but like, that's what works for her, right? Like there's no issues coming up from her being out so much. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're allowing your dog to be outside of the crate and everything's going fine, they're not exhibiting any kind of like bad behaviors, then I mean, by all means, give them more freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're giving your dog more freedom and you're seeing more problems then that's a sign to, you know, go back and implement more crate time. Mm -hmm. I, I think the leash has been the best thing for Rika and, and for myself. Yeah. Like with having her in the house. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the leash is like it honestly, um, I still use it on Lycan, you know, Lycan's uh, just turned two in September. Um, but even I bring him out in a leash sometimes just because he's uh, crazy. So I have like stairs in my house and he has a really bad habit. If I don't take him out on a leash in the mornings, he likes to launch himself from like halfway down and just like jump off, you know, and he's almost hurt himself like doing that. So it's just like, all right, what's a simple solution I can do here? Boom, just take him out on a leash. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. even like, you know, even I still do it with some of my older dogs. Um, you know, Waylon can be kind of a, um, you know, kind of a dick when people come over. So um, I'll either put him on leash or put him in the crate, you know, because that's mm -hmm. just easier than him, you know, than me putting him through like, you know, wanting to go and like, bark at people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and Lycan is what kind of dog? He's a Dutch Shepherd. Okay. Um, do you also have a golden retriever? Yes. So I, got, I have a golden retriever puppy. I got him back in November. Okay. Yeah, so I, picked him, I picked him up on much. my birthday. Okay. How, how is that managing the three? A uh, new puppy I, and the Mal and Dutchie. I, mean, I feel like you got your hands full. Yeah. I mean, Waylon and Lycan are easy dogs. I mean, uh, Waylon lounges all day. And Lycan, if he's uh, if he's out and doing something like chewing on something, he's like he'll be super chill, um, or he can just hang out in the crate and come out when it's time to like exercise or do something. Um, I don't really let Lycan and Badger interact too much, just because if I did, they would just play all day. Um, you know, and my goal for uh, Badger is to be able to coexist with my dogs, not constantly interact with them. And Waylon does not care about interacting with dogs in the least bit. So he's like the perfect dog to have around. Like Badger doesn't really get anything out of Waylon. So it's, he's been a really good teacher at like just teaching Badger to be around dogs versus like always with them. Whereas Lycan, mm -hmm. Lycan loves playing with other dogs. So if I have them out together, they're just gonna wanna, you know, play with each other the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, but with crate training with um, and all that, it's honestly been super, super simple. Um, Badger is a mischievous little puppy. He's a lot of work. He was nothing like, nothing like, nothing I was expecting in the golden. He's honestly like having another Malinois Dutch puppy. What made you want to get a golden? So, um, he's going to be a detection prospect. I want to do like scent work with him. Um, and if he ends up being any good, I would like to use him for, uh, you know, events and stuff like that. And... Uh, when it comes to detection dogs, floppy ear dogs are more sought after just because they're less intimidating. So mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I would have, um, you know, went with another like Malinois, Dutch or Shepherd or something like that. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll see. And um, what has been your biggest challenge with Badger so far? Um, just staying on top of him. Like he's like not the puppy that can have any kind of like real freedom because he will get into something uh he's really into biting jumping uh he's a very pushy very confident puppy so um you know like when he finds something he wants to put in his mouth like his goal is to eat it not just to hold it um mm -hmm. you know so like watching him outside very closely him picking up sticks and stuff like that um you know given the chance he'll chew on cables like whatever he can get into his mouth um doesn't really like care about correction so even when i have the leash to stop him he's very pushy like he just wants he's just like you know what like um like if he's mouthing me for example right if he just wants to keep biting me and i'm like no like he'll just keep trying you know what i mean so um a lot of like redirecting him with other stuff giving him something else to chew on um mm -hmm. uh giving uh giving him something else to do rather than you know just biting on me um, mm -hmm. I mean, even interacting with Waylon, he's very pushy with Waylon and, um, you know, I do believe that, um, uh, that Waylon could teach him about interacting with other dogs and stuff like that. But even when like Badger's being too much and Waylon tries to correct him, like Badger doesn't care. Like mm -hmm. he'll keep going for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Waylon can give, be giving him like all the warning signs, but I always have to step in and, you know, stop it myself because Badger just doesn't care. Mm -hmm. It's funny when you describe your three dogs, like the way you describe Badger and he's a golden retriever, it sounds very much like uh, how how you describe Waylon as chill, like on the couch all day, like pet. Um, can yeah. you kind of talk about how like breed characteristics aren't always true to every dog? like? You know, you can have a Malinois that's chill, like chilling on the couch all day. That's an interesting comment. Redirecting for biting that gets you a bit more. I don't understand that. <laughs> um, um, what were you saying? Sorry. 
Uh, I, I was saying, uh, like the way that you describe Whalen, your your Malinois, uh, is like chill and like stereotype would be like that would be the golden retriever who's yeah. like, chill and wants to be a pet and yeah is fine with that. Um, but with your golden, you're training for detection, like that working working dog. Yeah. Um, how can you just kind of talk about how like how like a golden a golden retriever can be a working dog <laughs> yeah so i mean he is uh so he is a field bred golden retriever so he comes from hunting lines right so there are they are gonna have more drive like his mom is uh his mom is titled like and i i'm not too familiar with hunting and their titles and stuff like that but i know the mom has a lot and so does the dad you know so i was expecting a drivey puppy like it, like i'm not really surprised you know, I did want this, like, kind of energy, but I wasn't expecting it to be this, like, uh, I like, I don't know what's the word. Um, like, I knew I was going to get a drivey puppy. I didn't know I was going to get such a mischievous puppy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because Badger wants to just, like, do his oh. own thing, right? He wants to do whatever he wants, right? Which, if I'm, like, looking for a strong dog for, like, protection sports, like, yeah, that's a great trait, but for him, I need to him to be like a little more calm, a little more, uh, more biddable, but you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just him. I'm not really complaining. I, you know, at the end of the day, I do like it. I like the confidence. I like that he can like, he's not afraid to, you know, do what he wants. But right now as a puppy, it's just like a shock, you know, like yeah. I wasn't expecting this from the golden. Mm -hmm. And, um, what are your goals with Lycan, your Dutch? Uh, so Lycan right now we're training in PSA. We're going to, hopefully go for our one in uh, March. There's a trial coming up, um, but I'm on the wait list. That one filled up really quick. So we'll see, but we're working towards it right now. Yeah, see Maya knows canine answers. Retrievers are so mischievous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so right now we're working on uh, going for, for our one, first leg of our one. Awesome. Um, and, Natalie, I think this is Natalie. My Mal has always hated the crate and freaks out anytime she is in there and has been like that ever since we got her. Any tips? I use tr treats, toys, and I'm pretty sure he, she has a, um, a duchy puppy. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, if uh, again, it's like kind of one of those things I have to see, like really get a little more detail on what's going on going on because maybe the puppy wasn't like properly introduced um it could be uh um you know the owner's giving into any kind of like noise or anything that the dog is making so like for example um when Waylon was a puppy trying to crate train him right it was frustrating because i would i did what everyone said right you just got to wait him out right mm -hmm. but Waylon would just not quit Right. So I tried to yell at him. I tried to tell him to stop. And it's just like, but any kind of interaction he got from me when I was, uh, um, when he was like screaming, that was like rewarding to him. Right. Mm -hmm. So he would just keep doing it. Cause he knew eventually I would and come he, in yeah. and fix it. I would come mm -hmm. in and fix it. Right. Um, he learned that if he like, you know, Peter pooped in there that I was going to take him out so that I can clean it, you know? So, you know, I, you know, you kind of have to figure out, what is your dog really screaming about? Are they really nervous about being in the crate or, you know, are they manipulating you into, you know, getting them out and having it uh, go their way? Um, but I would say do really quick, short sessions, like, you know, get some really high value treats. You can feed them their meals in there. Um, don't expect them to stay in there for too long. You know, just even if you close the door 30 seconds and it's quiet, like reward them for that. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. let them come out. Um, but uh, um, but I mean, yes, yeah, pretty much it. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. like uh, no, 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 you're good. Um, also, can you explain the difference between uh, a working dog and a pet dog? If you have a Malinois or a Dutchie, it, does that uh, classify your dog as a working dog? No. So working dog isn't classified by breed. Just because you have a Malinois doesn't mean it's a working dog. So. In my opinion, a working dog has to have some kind of job, right? So, um, you know, 
So you can go into the obvious, like the police dogs, military dogs, that kind of stuff. Um, for sport dogs, I consider, you know, working dogs to be like in the, any sport that kind of has like a bite component to it, right? Because in PSA, it's the dog's job to stop the attacker and do all that. In IGP, they have to, you know, um, escort the, the helper or whatever it is, right? Like that's their job, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, um, but I mean, if you just have a pet Malinois that goes to the dog park all day, like that's not a working dog. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? There's nothing that the dog's working for, working towards, mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, Mela Galvis, sorry if you've already covered this. My puppy is five months and solid on commands. Would it be too early to work with a trainer to start on the e-collar? Um, definitely not too early to start with a trainer. Um, but it would be up to uh, that trainer to decide whether they're ready for the e-collar or not. Um, five months is a little young. I would say like the, I would, like if I had to pick a number, like I would say like maybe six months is when a dog would start. Maybe is maybe ready for it. But again, that's dependent on the dog. And that's something you would have to discuss with that trainer. But definitely not too early to hire a trainer for, you know, just to get started off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. um, what made you uh, decide to have Lincoln go into um, protection and um, Badger go into detection? I'm sorry, one more time. So um, Lincoln is your PSA protection sport dog. Mm -hmm. So um, what inspired you to get Lincoln into that, that area? And then what inspired you to get Badger into the de detection work? Um, so, I mean, ever since I got Waylon, I was interested in doing sport and Waylon just wasn't cut out for it. Um, I, uh, originally wanted to do a uh, ring sport, but then I had learned about PSA because at the time it was still more like of an East coast thing and I didn't really know too much about it. Um, but it really interested me and I knew that when I got Lycan that that's what I wanted to pursue. Um, and then for detection is, uh, like I had mentioned earlier, when I was working at Gold Coast, that's what I did over there. And I really, really enjoyed it. I loved going to events and um, running the dogs, looking for odors. I did uh, school searches as well, going, uh, going to schools, looking for, uh, looking for different narcotics and stuff like that. Um, so I knew that once I left there, it was something I still wanted to pursue. So I'm hoping that's something I can do with, uh, with Badger when he's older. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you started your own training business, uh, what was the biggest challenge that you faced? Um, I think just getting my name out there, you know, um, to be honest, I got cocky and I thought it was going to be easy because I had, uh, because I had Wayland's page. Right. And I was just like, Oh, I got tons of followers on here. It'll be easy. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was not the case at all. You know, um, I feel like people really put me in the category of just like, uh, oh, just another like Instagram dog trainer, right? Like didn't really know mm -hmm. what I was doing, not realizing how much knowledge and stuff that I actually had mm -hmm. um, and what I can, uh, like what I can help people with. Um, so like really just making a name for myself. And it wasn't until I got a few clients under my belt and they started recommending me is like when the ball really started rolling. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I actually don't get uh, too many people from like Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. A lot of my clients come from word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, can you talk a little bit about how, like, when you're just starting off, it's good to, um, like, you obviously had a solid foundation with working with Oscar and then also working with, um, is, wait, is it Gold Coast Canine or West Coast Canine? Gold Coast Canine. With Gold Coast Canine. Yeah. Um, like, what about that? What about both interactions, like, really made you... Um, so I actually, like, strange. when I got Waylon and met Oscar, I only had one session with him. I, I never got to go back because it was just that. The schedule just didn't work. Um, I didn't start really working with Oscar until I got Lycan as a puppy. Then I went back to him. But um, with Gold Coast, um, I just got my hands on, like, on all kinds of dogs. Like, very strong dogs, you know, working with, um, like, actually, like, aggressive dogs and stuff like that. So... Um, and I was working with dogs all day, like all different kinds of dogs. Every week we were getting in new dogs. So just so much experience from that, from working with, you know, um, you know, all types of behaviors and, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, some dogs were like stronger than others. Some were nervier than others. Some were smarter than others, you know, 
got a real variety there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And how long were you there before you branched off? About a year. Awesome. Um, very cool. My, my last question is going to be, um, I have been, I've noticed actually, like, um, with a lot of uh, female trainers, uh, they're a, a little bit more quiet on Instagram, or it's a little bit more, it's harder to get them, like, on for a Q&A, or, like, you know, just kind of put themselves out there. Do you find that, or is that just me? Um, I mean, not really. Um... I mean, no, not really. I mean, uh, any resistance I had to do in this Q&A wasn't because I was afraid to, like, you know, put myself out there or anything like that. It was more just, like, me being kind of, like, shy, um, you know, mm -hmm. being nervous in front of the camera and stuff. But, I mean, being a female handler has never affected me, you know. I know, uh, and I feel like I've been lucky to have been, you know, like, I've never been treated differently I, I've never felt like people look down on me because I was a female or anything like that and I know that's not the same for everybody you know but um I can't I don't have like any experience with that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but um I do think uh women like a lot of women on here get a lot of uh get a lot of heat sometimes for even just being themselves you know um I've seen people talk down on girls who just want to like take nice pictures with their dogs but it's like it's why does that bother people so much? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just like maybe afraid of not being taken so seriously could be, mm -hmm. could be a thing. Mm -hmm. I, I saw one of your posts that I really loved. Um, it was talking about uh, how the, the, talking about the dog world and how sometimes it can be a, a toxic space. Um, are you saying that from the dog trainer's perspective or just a dog owner's perspective? Um, it's, um, just dog owner perspective, honestly, because I mean, with, uh, with Wayland's page and with how big it grew, you know, I had uh, a lot of people that I met through Wayland's page and stuff like that. Um, you know, so with the big page, you know, your name's going to get thrown out. People are going to form these opinions about you and not even like, uh, without even like having met you, they're going to take what someone else says about you and just apply that to their own opinion mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and I think it's something that when you go into the dog world, you kind of have to go through and learn, mm -hmm. you know, because I did it. Like I had like, I, you know, had my like toxic moments and stuff like that, where I had to reflect and be like, damn, like that wasn't, you know, that's not really me, but mm -hmm. sometimes this community and the people in it can really, uh, uh, can really affect you in that way, right? Because mm -hmm. it's easy to get wrapped up in, you know, someone else's opinion when, you know, you get along with that person, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think what a lot of people struggle with is like coming up with their own original thoughts and ideas. And it takes time, I feel like, um, you know, I've, um, right now, like the training group that I'm with right now has been such a positive influence on me in like, so many ways, like I have a much more positive outlook on stuff. I'm a lot less like, you know, don't have those like toxic thoughts and stuff like that. It's just, you know, I think you have to find the right, the right group, mm -hmm. you know, find the right group, find the people that you really mesh with and that bring that really, really do bring out the best in you. And it might take some time to find those people, you know, you might have to go through some hardships before that happens. Mm -hmm. Life. Um, also, uh, with Whalen's page, I'm not so familiar with it. What types of stuff were you sharing on that? So on Wayland's page was just like your typical pet page, just literally what we were doing our, on our day to day at the time when I got Wayland. And I think which is why it grew so big. Um, when I got Wayland, I got Wayland at a, what I considered like kind of like a difficult time. I had just, I had to move back in with, uh, with family after living with my boyfriend. Um, so Wayland was kind of like my uh, uh, saving grace at that time. And at the time I was working I think I was working at a movie theater working like two days a week. So mm -hmm. I had like all this time on my hands to do like everything. So me and Waylon were at the park all day. We were going on hikes. Um, I was doing all kinds of like cool, like making him do cool stuff, like jump on tiny surfaces and posting about that. You know what I mean? Um, and then uh, once I got a little bit busier, then that kind of started to taper off, which is when I feel people started not uh, following as much. 
But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I still have that page open just because there is a lot of like cool memories and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but I knew when I was going to start my business that I wanted like a fresh start. So starting a new page was the right move for me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I feel like uh, your and Waylon's relationship is very similar to me and Rika's <laughs> with uh, sharing the Instagram and whole, whole yeah. life and life changes. Yeah. Um, the other, the last question, we're, we're, we're like at an hour now. Um, yeah. What are your future goals for um, your training business? And um, how, how will you manage like Badger as a detection dog, Lycan as a, you know, protection sports dog and well, well one being your pet dog, but, and then your business. Yeah. So, I mean, like having my own business being like, uh, you know, being my own boss, I get to dictate what my schedule is like. So if like an badger, like need, uh, you know, you know, more attention than usual, I'm able to like, you know, fit my schedule, you know, or um, arrange my schedule into uh, into something that works for them. Um, but honestly, like my goal is like, I'm not trying to have this like, huge business where I have like all kinds of dogs, you know, the thing I enjoy most about dog training is teaching. So my goal is to eventually like put on seminars and, you know, teach people like uh, teach larger groups of people everything that I know versus like, you know, just are you getting comfy. Okay, good. No. <laughs> Too small of a spot, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, I mean, my goal is to teach people. So eventually, like, I want to be able to put on seminars, find um, whatever, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, find whatever it is I'm, like, best at teaching, you know, whether that be the e-collar or, you know, engagement or, you know, whatever that is, and, you know, able to travel and go and teach other people. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Leah, it was so nice chatting with you and getting to know you. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I wish you the best with with everything, with your dogs and with your business. Thank you. So, I, thank you. I'll I'll post this and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right. Have a good Bye. night. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.